Mm-hmm. That, that, that the erosion of our Africanity has not, has not been complete. I mean, that, the mm-hmm. fact that we come here and, and, and feel the emotional spirit of this place is evidence that that ancestral spirit is still touching us. Mm-hmm. If it had been eroded totally, we'd come through here and we'd play games and we'd, you know, we'd do little silly things and we'd, uh, and, and, and we'd go home and not be touched by this. Mm-hmm. The fact that we are touched by this is evidence that that spirit's there. So the process of, of us giving up the African for the European has not been complete. So you can't say we gave it up. You know, we've been eroded, it's like sandpaper. Mm-hmm. You know, you got, you got all this lacquer, this white paint on us. Mm-hmm. You're gonna keep rubbing it and keep rubbing it before you get down to the real ebony wood. Mm-hmm. And so that's all, this, they just painted some stuff over us. And if, you do, if I can use that analogy of the spirit, they just painted mm-hmm. over us and coated us and so our bodies don't breathe right. You know, our mm-hmm. texture, the skin doesn't, doesn't perspire right because we've got this, this crud on us. Mm-hmm. There, there's another spiritual system. It's not even a spiritual, it's another system that uh, affected us. Mm-hmm. And, that's what, and, and that's what we're doing now. We're, we're, we're working through that. And, that, and, and our, our spirits are breaking out mm-hmm. of, this, of this long history of confusion, confusion uh, that, that came about from this place. And you just think, if you think about and try to imagine what it was like, now, we came down on a bus. It took us a good while to get down on the bus. Some of us were, were screeching and talking about we were kind of uncomfortable on that bus. But can you imagine being driven by, by, by beasts, by people who had given up their right to be human, by beasts with, with brutalization for days and days and days? And then getting to this place, and in that same fog that you see now, sort of dull brightness of this fog, you, you come out of the bush in that same fog. Imagine the psychological rupture that was occurring. And you're thrown through this place, and you're coming to this place, and you're gathering. Now there are a thousand other black men and women like you in this place, and they're moaning, and they're groaning, and you got these savages running around here. Think about the horror and the torture of that moment, you see. And so the fact that we're here, and are even, even able to walk and talk and think is evidence of our strength. That process alone should have killed us. This is the female slave dungeon at Elmino Castle in Ghana, West Africa. From one to two hundred women would be packed in this holding pen. There were iron bars and gates. No one could escape. There was very little ventilation, only a hole about 18 by 18 inches was in the wall. It was always dark in this pen. There were no sanitary conditions or facilities. The women had to do everything in a bucket that were placed in each corner. The longer the women stayed, the more they died. They died from lack of sanitary conditions, no ventilation, overcrowdedness, and diseases. They were often here from one, two, to three months. Periodically, the women were let out into a courtyard. If there was a rebellious woman she would be tired to these cannonballs and left to stand in the sun for days. The soldiers would stand on a balcony just above where these women are now and observe the women to choose which they would rape for the night. That woman would be sent up to them through a trap door just behind them. If she rebelled in any way, again, she would be beaten and tired to these cannonballs and left in the sun. These are some of the original iron bars, hundreds of years old. Please continue, please. Watch the gutter, please. Behind. This was the exit for the women to the ship. 
But these iron bars were put here recently to prevent accidents. There were steps from where they could get down there. Mm -hmm. The main catches were made to join the women down. This is the male dungeon. Two to three hundred men were cramped in this holding pen from one to three months as they waited for the ships to arrive. There was very little ventilation. This is the only ventilation. It was always dark. Iron bars and gates on the windows. This is the passage that they would meet the women as they were led to the ships, still in chains. Much closer. Oh. That's now receded. Oh. So when the ship came, it anchored some distance away. They brought small boats down here to take them, still in chains, mm -hmm. before they were taken to the ship, oh. then off to the far away places. Yes. Keeping them in a dungeon for one month, two months, or three months, and long walk from the hinterland to this place yes. made them weak and lean. So when the ship arrived, yes, they could pass through here. And why here, that was only ventilation. That's why we came all the way down. Well, the, this, this fortress of Castle was where it all started. It was 18, I mean, 1482. And it has been proven that a little known sailor, Christopher Columbus, was in the expedition. They had landed, now well dressed. They were trying to impress the Africans that they were people sent by the gods. And when the king, King Asa, refused to buy the Bible story that they're coming to civilize them, he was forced to buy the gun story. Mm -hmm. And they forced their way in. So first they were looking for gold. And almost for 200 years, this was the headquarters of the gold trade. This is why this part of Africa was once called the Gold Coast. People forget that Ghana still has a high quality, quantity of gold. But this is the first large holding station for slaves. The, the uh, Dutch have had it, the Portuguese have had it, finally the British uh, took it over. The British were late coming into the slave trade, but they came in furious and they organized it and made it a business, almost like gangsters in a city. One, one group of gangsters, the west side, one or the uh, east side, and they don't interfere with each other unless they want trouble. Once the British established themselves, they were the bosses of the whole slave trade. And they put slavery, slave stock on the British Stock Exchange. There are 40, six of these folks, depending on who's doing the counting. And if 36 are in Ghana, that tells you what, what the headquarters of the slave trade was. Slaves were brought from all over West Africa to Ghana for reset. And then they trek from the hinterlands to the coast. Sometimes seven out of 10 died in passage. This also indicates that you never get a correct statistic on what Africa laws, who lived through it and who died in the midst of it. Maybe a larger number died than, than went on the ships. In Adubuan, in an article called the Impact of Slavery on West Africa proved that all of this was not necessary. <laughs> But where we are, Cape Coast, the Cape Coast area, is the basic home of the frantic people. 
they have always been the intellects of Ghana and the petitioners and the constitution makers. They're difficult with the increment that the increment failed to recognize this. Otherwise, they could have helped a great deal towards stabilizing his government. Mm -hmm. But this is, well, neither here nor now, uh, now right now, but uh, once you understand the dimensions of this fort, understand that the, the luxurious apartments on top of it, and that men calling themselves Christians lived in these apartments while the greatest misery ever inflicted on the people was happening, right, one, one flight below. If you look in the inside, you see a ladder going up to the quarters of the slave captains. That was called the ladder of shame. The virgin goods were paraded in the courtyard, and any of the captains could pick one for that night to violate. And she came up that ladder to his apartment. Sometime if girls were pregnant before the ships came back in, they would let them stay. Therefore, around each slave fort, there was a community of mixed breeds. But to the everlasting credit of the mixed breeds and the descendants in Ghana, none of them ever turned against their mother's people in favor of their European father's people. In fact, one of them, Kaysla Hayford, a descendant of that group, is the political architect of Ghanaian politics in the 20th century. And one of them, a descendant of a mixed breed, is now president of Ghana. But of all the games that has been played, he never played the color game. <laughs> And that's to his credit, whatever, not to his credit, that is to his credit. That you could have had a color fight here in Ghana, but you didn't have it because the mixed breeds never saw themselves as being any different from other Africans in, in this country. The Kwesi Brews, that family, still live in Ghana, and they were descendants of black slave trading families. The Randolphs, the descendant of German missionary family. But this is a historical place, and it's more than just an attraction to look at dungeons. I hope people here look at the door of no return, because uh, after they went out of that door, they never saw Africa again. And this would go on 300 years of slavery. We've been going for 200 years as colonialism. Many people say the Africans sold themselves into slavery. Well, the Africans were in a bind. Africans were armed by Europeans. The Europeans created a scale between one and the other. The Africans were naive enough to fall for it. Some of the Africans participated in the slave trade because they were corrupt. And some of them were told, either you catch a slave for me or you become one. While all this is keep repeating, no one qualifies this. No one understands the nature of slavery. No one understands that within Africa, it wasn't a slave trade. It was a system of servitude. And in the African system of servitude, families were not broken up. And in many times, an African in servitude to another family became head of that same family. So there's no comparison between the internal African system of servitude and the European slave trade. Because in that slave trade, in that system of servitude, nobody left Africa. Nobody was enslaved. Yes, some Africans did participate, but what assisted the Europeans more than anything else was the rapid fire gun, mm -hmm. except for the gun. They couldn't penetrate the hinterland. And that's how they penetrate the hinterland. I think once the African accept his fair share of what he did, he, slavery was a three continent industry involving a revolution in maritime science. The 
revolution in economics, the revolution in navigation. The African did not have the equipment to bring off anything this big. In terms of your finally, uh, Dr. Clark, in terms of that, um, that trade, that uh, the slave trade in building the industry of Europe, could you talk about that briefly? It, it did more than just build the industries of Europe. It rescued the economy of Europe and gave Europe the means of expanding in the Americas into the so-called New World. It helped to lay the basis of the plantation system, which was a modification of the feudalism that Europe had known in Europe. Europe does not come to civilize. They come to bring their way of life, and they bring a way of life that, can, that they can use to control others. There was fierce competition between European and European, not only over the slave trade, but over geographic positions to trade. I mean, uh, Jamaica's changed hand three times, ending with the English. The several islands have changed, the French islands, modernly Guadalupe, They've changed hands several times. So you see the fierce competition between the Europeans for that territory caused a war between them. But they didn't fight each other into, into extinction. Thank but you. the Africans fought all along. They degraphed chances too. The British told them that if you can write a constitution that a civilized people can live by, I will consider leaving your country. They wrote a constitution that was so good, it was better than the British constitution. The British put all the conferees in jail, except King Gotti, who really was a missionary trained African named Johnson. They really gave given the name Johnson. But the kingship was weak. So one thing about African royalty, if, if you just being royal, royal, that don't make you they have the throne. If you weaken royal, they just make someone else royal. Put him on. <laughs> so Johnson became King Gotti. And he led the uh, Fanti Confederacy, the unification of the Fanti, Fanti nations along the coast. The, the, the other petition titled in 1844, Dunquad wrote an excellent article on that. I have all that in my files given to me by Dunquad, autographed by Dunquad. This is, um, Elmina has been virtually declared an international monument, so th this is world class. Mm -hmm. so there's going to be a lot of money poured in here, but the question is, mm -hmm. will it tell the story the way it should and be how told? It be used. And that becomes a question mark. We need simplified books telling the story that people can, laymen can read and understand, and also children can read and understand. We need to explain slavery out of with a, with a world background. There's a man named Blake has done a, I don't know what people don't need to do, a whole history of slavery as an institution. And that's what I'm going to try to do in, the, in this revised uh, book on, that I edited on. It's called Slave, The Slave Trade. I might even give it another title. But, but the idea is I'm going to bring together some little known aspects of slavery. Mm -hmm. This is why we're going both from you and uh, Scobie. Scobie. And also Shashi, Dr. Shashi has already delivered her paper. I already got Shashi's paper. I got something from uh, Clinton Cox, The Impact of Slavery on West Africa, by Edward Boyan. And he said he thought that would be more appropriate because in it he proved that the slave trade cheated both the African and the European. It wasn't that, wasn't that necessary, mm. which is a point of view we have. Oh, did Wade get back? Um, yeah, no, uh, Wade? Is this your first trip here at uh, Elmina? No, this is my third time visiting Elmina Dungeon. Mm -hmm. You mind talking about it, maybe remembering the first time you came here? And the first time I came here was in, was almost 25 years ago. And uh, when my wife and I came here, it was uh, not as developed around the, the dungeon. And so it was a, a different experience. I'm, I have mixed feelings about what's happening around the dungeon. It seems as if uh, 
this is becoming a, a tourist attraction as opposed to a, a pilgrimage to some sacred ground that represents the, uh, the rupture of, uh, of the African sense of being for those who ended in the uh, New World, who in the diaspora. Uh, it is still a very difficult place to be. Uh, it is, uh, there are echoes in this place of the horror and the pain and the blood of, uh, of our ancestors that are still here. And uh, I find myself not being able to talk, and uh, I'm a talker. Uh, and so I try to not be in the, the treadmill of going around these rooms. Uh, it's just a very difficult place to be. You're a psychologist. Yes. And, uh, putting together uh, films on all these dungeons, uh, and we're telling the stories through the eye. See, the, the, uh, it's, it's hard for psychologists to talk about this because we're not immune to the, the same spirit that possesses all of us. When the Africans come back to this place, if you watch closely, you'll see that uh, we're, we enter the place sort of as tourists and, uh, and uh, with a tourist mentality. When you come into this place, something comes over you. And I think that what comes over you is that there's been the spirits of our ancestors that died here, not the ones that went through the gate of no return, but the ones who died here. Their spirits are still in this place. And, uh, and, and they recognize, as spirits do, recognize their children. And so you'll find different reactions to this place because people are being touched by their personal ancestral spirits, those that actually died here. And, uh, and so you'll find people who are very conservative and who are just here because tourists begin to weep, begin to cry. You find people who, who will uh, uh, just get disoriented. And it's because they're being collected up, if, if, you, if I can use that term. They're being collected up because the ancestral spirit does that. It reaches and collects us up. And so, this, so because we have lost a lot of our education, a lot of our training on how to handle that, we don't know what is happening to us. But what is happening is that those souls that, are, that were killed here, that were, murdered and brutalized here, reaching out and touching us. They're touching us softly and, and, and they're touching us and, 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 and letting us know that that circle wasn't broken. That even though we thought the circle was broken, that when we were pushed through that, 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 that gate of no return and, uh, and beaten down those, these little narrow hallways and, and tortured or our, or our women beating up that ladder to be brutalized by some savage beast, that all those things that happened to us did not break the circle. And that when you're in this place, no matter no matter how distant you are from the concept of the circle being unbroken, that circle reaches and grabs you. And that the ancestors, the spirits that are here, touch you and uh, in many different ways. Uh, and I think that people who come here, the Africans who come here, when they leave, they're never the same. That, they, that they're never the same in terms of... Even if they think they are, that their, their dreams will change, their, that their, their thoughts will change, that their dedication to work changes, that this place has to be explained. And it's important that we take responsibility for explaining what happens when you come to this place because it's rapidly becoming a tourist attraction. And people are going to be having, kids outside right now have trinkets that they're trying to sell. There's a tourist attraction. And we have to be careful not to allow this to become a tourist attraction. It has to be seen as a pilgrimage. It has to be seen as a point of no longer no return, but a point of return. Mm -hmm. The spiritual force is here. Uh, it is in the walls, as you just said. It's in the walls. It's in the it's in the ground. It's in the in, in the movement. It's in the rhythms of here. If you just quiet yourself and listen to that ocean, the voice of that ocean is exactly the same voice that has been there from the beginning of time. The sound of that ocean is what our ancestors heard over the weeps and over the moans and over the groans of their pain. They heard that same ocean that we're hearing right now and that's speaking to us and we need to make that connection. Thank you very much. Um, I was supposed to be here early. They gave me another assignment. They didn't pick me up to go to the assignment. I followed their instructions and waited at the hotel. I would love to be here when I can uh, be more fully in depth on this subject because there's a whole lot of illusions about Africa's relationship with other people in the world. 
There's a whole lot of illusion about our relationship to the religions in the world. And these belief systems that had its origin in Africa, all of them, and there is no exception, turned on African people. I said there is no exception. And there's one thing you have to get through your mind and keep it. Nothing that ever came from the European mind was meant to do anything but facilitate European domination of the world. And I said, there's no exception. <laughs> everything that was brought into this continent, everything, every idea, every so-called religion, was meant to dominate and to control. The Alps had no illusions about it. The Europeans had no illusions about it. You were the ones with the illusions. And yet every element that went into the making of every major religion in the world started in Africa. Why is it that you are so naive? You let people redress something that you invented, send it back to you, and enslave you through it. I'm saying that all organized present religions are male chauvinist murder cults. And I say there is no exception. <laughs> well, I wanted to be here earlier. I wanted to deal with our relationship with the people of the world and the fact that we created peaceful nations that had no word for tail because no one had ever gone to one. No word for old people's home because no one ever thrown away grandma and grandpa. No word for orphanage. We did all of this, and over half of human civilization was over before we knew that a European was in the world. Before he wore a shoe or lived in a house that had a window. Now, Africa has always and still is the prize for the whole world. We as a people have always been the world's richest people, culturally rich, mineral rich. We have always been the prize because we have always had and still have something that other people won't, think they can't do without, and don't care to pay for. Because we have always been the prize, we have been under siege for over 3,000 years. Nothing that ever brought into Africa from the outside was meant to do the African any good. That means all other religions. Islam was the handmaid of Arab imperialism. Christianity was the handmaid of European imperialism. The Hebrew faith was the handmaid of a concept called the chosen people. Now, if God is kind and God is merciful and God has no stepchildren, he won't choose one over the other. And to say he chose some people, you're making him a bigot. And to say that he endorsed enslavement of one people over the other, you're making him an assessment to murder. The Arabs used Islam to rationalize their slavery and their imperialism. The Europeans use Christianity to rationalize their slavery and imperialism. Who are you kidding about friends in the world? Damn it, if you want a friend, look in the mirror. There's a billion African people on the face of this earth. Why are you buying third-rate junk from third-rate people thinking you can't make it? Why don't you at least make a safety pin to hold your child's diaper together? Beach. Who has programmed your mind to think you can't make a car? The first man that made a car that had never seen one previously. Beach. The Japanese bought cars, bought locomotives, broke them down and studied them and had a Japanese technician produce each piece, put it together and had a much better train than the one they copied from. Uh -huh. 
All knowledge in the world belongs to everybody in the world. Yes. Who has programmed our mind in assuming that we cannot run a nation and run it well? The main thing imperialism did, slavery and imperialism, they removed African people from the respectful commentary of history. And they tell them, something they are still telling them, and all of the organized religions are guilty of this, I favor none of it because Africa didn't need any of it. I'm saying that African belief systems, properly understood, is 10 times better than Judaism, Christianity, and in Islam. And better for the Africans. So you might have some romance with one of these religions. I have no romance with any of them. I have a romance with reality and truth. And the chips can fall where they may after I tell it. As for friends, you have had no friends. When they discovered you, they began to prey on you. Now let's look at our relationship with Western Asia, mistakenly called the Middle East. For 3,000 years, our greatest enemies came from Western Asia. They were trying to avenge the fact that they were once African colonies. You read a book called When Egypt Ruled the East, and you get some of the basic information on this. Now, the first visitors to Africa came in the 1700 BC. These were the people who would later be called Hebrew. Now, black people are ticklish on this because black people think that everything in the Bible is true. I question the intelligence of anyone who thinks everything in the Bible is true or supposed to be true. <laughs> it's allegory, told, stories told to illustrate a point at a time when there were very few people reading books. And most of what you went into the making of the Bible was copied from Egyptian texts. Now, if you want to get so dewy eyed over the Bible, which is, which is a carbon copy of a carbon copy, why don't you go back and read the original Egyptian text? <laughs> then you see where all these stories started from. You see where the story of the Exodus started from. Now, you get so dewy eyed, you actually think there was an Exodus. These people walked into Africa. Why couldn't they walk out? Why did they have to go by sea? Go. What you see at the park? If you read Egyptian literature, you will discover that the whole story of somebody parting the sea started with about 3,000 years before the Hebrew entrance. I should not use the word Hebrew entrance before the entrance from Western Asia. Now let's get one thing straight because black people are confused about all religions. Now I'm not against any religion. I'm a very spiritual human being. I just don't need a preacher to preach no Ten Commandments to me when he's a backslider going with some sister, some other man's wife. <laughs> I'm intelligent enough to pick from the Ten Commandments, well, not commandments anyway, but the omissions of purity at the great school at Luxor, Luxor, the great African training school. All right, now, let's get into this Western Asia. I'm saying that the people who came from Western Asia escaping famine did not have any Hebrew faith when they came into Africa. And there's no record of a Hebrew faith before that. Why is it that when they left Africa in the so-called Exodus, they had all three, African culture, an African religion, and an African language. Now look at the origin of so-called people you now refer to as Jews. You're mistaken using that reference because the word Jew is of European origin. And the people in Europe who call themselves by their name have no relationship to the biblical people of the Hebrew faith. And I'm saying that the people we now call Jews entered world history with their visit to Africa. And when Africa was invaded, 1675 BC, instead of joining the Africans who had been, been 
that been that beneficiary and saved them from starvation, they joined the enemies of Africa. No one has ever turned, returned any favors to us. As a people, we have always been hospitable to strangers, mostly the wrong stranger. And what we have to understand now in the period of superior brainwashing is there is no European answer for African problems. Either Africans find a solution to African problems or there is no solution. And if you don't find a solution soon, you go back into slavery. We have to stop all of this nonsense about who belongs to what religion when all of them were imposed on us in the first place. We stop all this fight between Muslims and Christians when neither one of the religions are doing them any good or moving them toward, 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 toward independence. All of them are handmaids of conquerors. All of them are religions of conquerors. We were naive when we accepted their interpretation of something that we had all along. I'm saying we, have, we need to take a good look at ourselves. I'm not talking about burning churches. I'm not talking about getting rid of religions. Understand me well. I am saying that every single thing that touches your life, religious, socially, and politically, must be an instrument of your liberation, or you must throw it into the ash can of history. Right. Develop a liberation Islam. Yes. And if you develop a liberation Islam, you have to turn off the supreme slave traders who were in the slave trade a thousand years before the Europeans, the Arabs. Yes. And most brothers who think they're Muslims are merely Arabs. Forerunners, vanguards of Arab propaganda. The Arabs are not above joining the Jews against black people. In America, they're already doing it in Detroit. In America, they're already doing it in real estate. You got some do it eyed thing, but you got a friend. I still ask you to look at that mirror. And if nothing's staring back at you and it's friendly, then you've got no friend. <laughs> But this is why you start, friend. All right. I'm saying something which you need to reconsider. I'm saying that everything that came into Africa, every people that came into Africa, did not come to do Africa any good. Everyone and every religion and every people who came into Africa declared war on African culture. They began the bastardization of African people created confused mulatto who didn't know whether he'd be loyal to his mother's people or his father's people. That confusion is still here. The fascination for the color of the conqueror and the fascination to go to bed with the conqueror. Now that's raw and mean, but it's true. Now, sometime ago, a North African leader, Gaddafi, was sending some Libyans to study in Europe. And he told them what any good nationalist would tell students going to study. I'm not sending you to Europe to find a wife. I'm sending you to Europe to gain the technology to come back and make Libya a strong nation, a strong Islamic nation, and a strong Arab nation. And you cannot achieve any of this between the legs of a European woman. <laughs> when is somebody going to get strong enough to tell Africans going to school, you're going to come back home and pair up with a sister? But if you want to pay up over there, stay over there. <laughs> now, the one thing we have to look at, and I'm sorry, I'm going to have to conclude on this because I've left out a body of information. At the university, I teach an entire course 
So that's the cause on Africa's relationship to other people. And I devote several semesters to Africa before, you know, the consequences of the coming of the Greeks who stole a lot that they think is their culture, stole a lot that you think is Greek philosophy. We've been the victims of propaganda. And yet, if you read the Journal of African Civilization, other works, we have lived in Europe, we've lived in Asia, we've lived in the Americas. The African people have already proved that they can get along with different people, amalgamate their culture with different people without one hint of a war between them. People who come into Africa immediately declare war on African culture, standards of beauty, standards of conduct, and change the African concept of theirs so they can move through him. This was true of the Greeks who began the bastardization, again, the European bastardization of Africa. The Western Asians had began it 3,000 years before that. The Romans, a bunch of well-dressed thugs who could write well but couldn't think, <laughs> who borrowed practically everything. They laughed at the Africans' concept of Christianity. The African was practicing and not giving it a name. This is why you don't know, know nothing about the African origins of Christianity. This is why a whole lot of people will not read Ben Yarkinen's The African Origins of the Major Western Religions, Africa Mother of Western Civilization, a Black Man of the Nile. Because he's telling it like it is, but you also will not read white radicals who identified Africa as the origin of the great religions of the world, especially Alvin Boyd Kuhn in his work, Who is this King of Glory? and shot off the third century. We have the death of John Jackson, another radical black historian, great man, God, and civilization. We let some of our great scholars die in hunger, die wanting for friendship. Now, having devoted my greater portion of my life to scholarship and teaching and digging up information on African people and trying to make African people face reality, I have often said a point that I wish you to consider. I didn't have to do it. I chose to do it. And if I had to do it over again, I would do it better. But, I have a lot of talent other than the talent to teach and to research. I've never met a rich man who had a better mind than me. So if I wanted to succeed as a rich man, I could have done that. I never met a crook who wasn't a fool. I could have been a good crook if I chose to be a crook. I chose to be a teacher of African history. I chose to look in the Bible where I couldn't find my people. I started looking for them in the world, and I didn't stop until I found them. And I know why they are left out of the Bible. I know why all the angels are wiped. You mean to tell me God is merciful, God is kind, and not one little brown or black angel sneaked into hell? I ain't buying that. <laughs> now the Bible that you get so dewy-eyed over is one of the greatest pieces of propaganda ever written. If you want to read the Bible, why don't you read the Bible one day and read Mein Kampf the next day and see the comparison? That's hard on your mind. Because you think if you don't have Christianity, Islam, or Judaism, you don't have that spirituality. I've got more spirituality after I put all of them down. <laughs> and I've got more religion after I put all of them down. All right, now let me conclude something that has no conclusion. <laughs> we have to look at the impact of Europeans on Africa. All impacts have been negative. The Romans laughed at the Af early African Christians. Finally, for political reasons, they stopped killing Christians and became Christians. 
I'm saying the European became Christian for political reasons, as the Arabs became Muslim for political reasons, and the, as the so-called Jews became Hebrews for political reasons. People use organizations for political reasons, and what we get so dirty eyed and think we're dealing with the truth. If you look at indigenous African religion belief systems, if you look at the idea when Africans had no churches of any consequence because these fools came here and said, this is the house of God, and the African looked at that church and said, if God who made the wind, the spring, made the ocean roar, and you don't tell me he can fit into a little thing you call a church? <laughs> that is no house of God. So some of them had the common sense enough to, buy, to move away from it, and some had the common sense to burn it down. I'm saying that you're closer to God when the further way you get away from organized religions that are all handmaidens of conquest. The Roman Empire <laughs> developed during the early period of Christianity. Remember, the Roman Empire started in Africa. It rose in Africa, it fell in Africa. A lot of people need to stop reading some religious books and read some straight history without faith, fable, without supposition, without myth. Read straight history. Read the Mediterranean world in ancient times. She's a racist, she's a bigot, but her chronology is good. And it's a good history of the European trying to move out of Europe into the Mediterranean to find something to eat to put on that gosh darn offer European food. <laughs> he has solved his problems at the expense of other people. The slave trade liberated Europe from the depressed economy they had created with the so-called crusades and through the famines and the plague. Europe always solves its problems by preying on people outside of Europe. They are in a position right now that they have betrayed true socialism, which was not of European origin in the first place. And some people are confused between Karl Marx and Groucho Marx. <laughs> I think a lot of people are Groucho Marxism instead of Karl Marxism. They're funny people. <laughs> and if you think that that system started in Europe, no system as humane as socialism could have started among a bunch of icebox people who pray on their brothers for their breakfast. <laughs> Read Palm and Colson's work, The History of the Modern World, especially the early chapters. Now, the evidence of Africans in the New World the evidence of 1,000 years of civilization before slavery. All of this I'm not discussing because there is no time. But when the Romans disgraced themselves in the mismanagement of Christianity, they created a vacuum. Islam moved into that vacuum. The Africans thought that Islam would get the Romans off of their back. They were right. Islam got the Romans over their back, and the Arabs jumped on their back, and they're still there, <laughs> using Islam to justify it. Now, the African military man, because we are the greatest fighting machine in the face of the earth, if we ever discovered this, people gonna start running. Under proper leadership, proper inspiration, properly equipped, the black man is the greatest human fighting machine God ever created, if indeed God created it. I think the gods of Africa created it. Once you lose track of your heritage, you lose track of your liberty in this world. The Europeans doing the slave trade not only read the African out of history, they colonized history, they colonized information about history. They colonized image. They colonized the image of God. Who told you Christ was what? 
He was born in that part of the world predominantly occupied by non-European people. So you should not get into the argument about whether he's white. All you have to say, was he a Greek? No. Was he a Roman? No. But these were the only people partially white in the area at the time. If he wasn't a Greek, he wasn't a Roman, he was one of those other people. You don't have to argue about the shades of color. So far as you're concerned, once you establish he was not a Roman, he was not a Greek, your conversation is over. Now, if somebody else want to argue about his shade, well, that's, that's their problem. Then if you got a problem with color, then you got a problem with your mother and your father. You have insulted your mother and your father if you don't like what they gave you. I wear mine like a badge of honor. I dig it. I wear it well. All right. Love it. I'm saying, in closing, and I am closing, <clears throat> that what you have to do is take a holistic look. Not, at, not only at your position in the world, but your potential in the world. You have to learn how to convert everything into an instrument of liberation or leave it alone. You have to realize there were no Greek fraternities and sororities until they were introduced to secret African society. People get all dewy-eyed over something that was imposed on them in order to control them without understanding that. That's another impure effort. So it bothers me, and although I have good personal friends who are Muslim, that not a single Muslim scholar have dealt with that 1,000 years of African independence before slavery and how the Arabs from the north systematically destroyed these nations. They actually, it did not occur. 1591, from Morocco, an army was launched against these great independent stations, in, independent nations in inner West Africa. These were great states. And because of poor communication between African and African, there was enough armies in these, uh, in these states to march down to the coast and to drive every slave trader into the sea. But the communication between African and Africa was so poor. Even today, the East Africa is not too clear about what's happening in West Africa. And nobody knows what's happening in North Africa because the conspiracy to hold on to Africa is happening in South Africa and in North Africa. So the whites in North and South Africa willing to play a part, and the pseudo whites in North Africa willing to play a part. In all this world, you have no friends. But if that a million, a billion of you on the face of this earth scattered all over the world, what do you need but the friend other than yourself? Why can't you turn inward on yourself and say, I will wear no clothes I don't produce? Start with your underwear. I wear no shoes that's not, that's not made by a brother. You're creating a shoe factory, employment at once. Start buying aeroplanes, break them down and study them, and later on make aeroplanes. What this whole thing is about is the restoration of confidence. It has been the role of these handmaidens of colonialism to destroy your confidence in yourself. You don't believe that you can look like a god. You don't believe a black father in your home is to some extent a god. That doesn't make the black woman less than a goddess. Because we produce the first human society that recognized and respected the female god. We produce the first human society that you can't be a king unless you got a queen. You can't be a god unless you got a god at. So you can see all of these social ills that people are defending now, none of it started in our countries. I defy anyone alive, and those who want to come alive, come back and prove me, I invite them too, to show me one single case of sexual deviance, a maladjustment, any place on the African continent for the coming of foreigners. Yeah. 
I defy you to show me one case of teenage pregnancy, one case of ill treatment of women. We got confused with someone else's ideas, someone else's concept and definition of us. What we have to understand is that faith has not spared us for an idle reason. A whole lot of people who've been hit less than us are extinct. What is there in us that made us strong enough to take this heavy blow? 500 years of slavery, one way or the other. Slavery, neo-colonialism. What made us strong enough to survive? What has faith saved us to do? And inasmuch as we gave the world its first humanity, faith has saved us to give the world its last humanity. <laughs> What we have to do is to believe it, to believe that we are worthy of it, and to believe that we are capable of it. What black studies should be about, what black religion should be about, is the restoration of the confidence, and the restoration of the confidence that we must rule the state again. There is not an imitation nation, that not a, an independent nation in Africa, or the Caribbean Island. They're all imitation European states. And what we have to understand is that the nation state is stagnant. The African did not live in a nation state, they lived in a territorial state. The African learned something very basic. Cultures have to be fertilized by cultures. People have to be fertilized by the interaction between cultures and cultures. This insecure European tighten his borders, you know. You got a passport to come here? The word passport is not in any African language. The things he invented to restrict himself, he imposed on other people. Once we gain confidence in ourselves, and once we look at that person staring back at us from that mirror and like what we see, and don't move from that mirror until you like what you see. Then, in coordination with other African people throughout the world, we will give the world a new lease on life. We will turn to all of our people and not one part of them. Because we came from a matrilineal society that respected women to the point the lineage came down to the female side. We must answer the call of the great African-American poet, Margaret Walker, who said, let the dirges end. Let a new peace begin. Let us write a new covenant for the freedom of ourselves in the world. African men throughout the world need to step forward and answer Sister Margaret and say, Sister Margaret, we have heard your call. And because we have never been a society that excluded women, with our women at our side, we are ready to pick up the challenge. We are ready to start a revolution that will change the world. We won't get ready tomorrow because tomorrow's things are left to tomorrow. We will start our revolution right now and we will start it with ourselves. Thank you. Since we have run over our time, I'm not quite sure what I should do since we have run over our time, but I know that there are some people who, who think, and we will try to have maybe just two or three um, questions. 
I see a hand. 